Welcome to today's second webinar in the Silage series on mowing and wilting. I'm Sophia Cusick of the Education Team in Communication and Stakeholder Engagement at the Department of Planning, Industry and Environment, and I'll be your host for today. I'd like to acknowledge that as we are meeting across the state in this virtual space, each of us stand upon the lands of many different nations. I'm meeting on Gadigal land, and I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land and waterway of the Eora Nation and pay my respects to their elders past and present and emerging. I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands and waters on which our online audiences join us from and pay respects to their elders past, present and emerging and extend that to all First Nations colleagues and guests that may be joining us today. I'd now like to hand over to Sue Street, our Livestock Senior Land Services Officer within Central West Local Land Services, to introduce the session. Thanks for that. Hi everyone and welcome to the second in our series of webinars in, on silage. So today um, John Pilts will be talking about the mowing and wilting uh, processes. Um, so I'm sure uh, hopefully a lot of you are either new today or have come back. Um, so it's been great to see such a large number of people participating in these webinars. Um, I also want to mention that the webinars today are, are brought to you by um, local land services and that they were organised by the ag teams from across the state. Uh, today we have John Pilts from New South Wales DPI um, to come and speak to you about the mowing and wilting process. So John has a long history uh, with New South Wales DPI and was also one of the co-writers of the Top Fodder Manual. So um, welcome, John. Thanks for coming for our second uh, webinar. Thank you, Sue, and thank you, everyone, online. Uh, today, last week, we, we looked at the impact of quality and timing of cut. Today, we're going to look at mowing and wilting. I just want to start off, I've got four questions that have been sent in and we'll address those as we go through. But the first one uh, is was a request for a copy of any notes from the first session. Every bit of information that I'm using is pretty much contained within the successful silage manual. So as I said before, you can get that online. I'll show you where at the end again. Similar to last week, I'm going to start today's presentation but looking at a few definitions and a couple of pictures of equipment so that we're all using similar language. I'm also going to talk about the effect of wilting on livestock production and then how can we speed up wilting rates and finally have a session on how to measure dry matter practically in the field or at home. Again, please questions as we go through are much appreciated. So firstly, these are probably all pretty simple, similar to what you people are using now, except for perhaps tether or tethered. So a swath, when I say swath, I'm referring to forage left behind a mower or mower conditioner. A tether is a machine which then spro spreads that mown forage out, and a tethered swath is what we refer to as the mown forage after it's been out, spread out. Whereas while I tend to use the term windrow, once that material has been pulled together, ready for harvesting, usually by a rake, which is designed for it, but sometimes um, some of the tethers are also capable of raking as well. I'm not going to get into too much discussion about machinery because there are a lot of people out there who sell machinery and know a lot more about it than I do. Also, equipment is changing all the time and what the information I have here to show you is a little bit out of date, but I think it gives you the principles. This is essentially what a tether looks like, and the tether is the one that people probably ask most about. It's like a series of rotary mixers all lined up together. And what a tether does is it takes all the main material and spreads it out. So if you can imagine that, uh, those rotary 
wheels working, you can see that the material is fluff, fluffed up in the air and you can see where all the materials loosely spread across the paddock rather than in a typical windrow at the time of cutting or a swath at cutting. That's just another example of windrowing and you can see again the, the, the material being thrown up in the air and spread out. <coughs> Excuse me. So mowers and mower conditioners, right at many years ago we all had drum mowers and all they did was basically mow and leave a windrow like this. But increasingly, and I think just about everybody now uses a mower conditioner which will tend to leave a swath more like this. I am asked occasionally what's the best mower conditioner and there's two main types. There's roller conditioners, this is one. And you can see in this instance it's two rubber rollers that as the forage passes through, it's cut and passes through, it breaks up, compresses and crimps the forage. This is another roller conditioner with one metal and one rubber roller. The other type of roller, uh, the other type of conditioner that you will see is called a flower conditioner. These tended to be a lot more prevalent down in places like Victoria, where they were used on um, mainly ryegrass pastures and the like. Now, they, they work by those tines, if you like, rapidly rotating and hitting the material as it goes through, damaging them. The whole purpose of trying to condition is to create essentially fracture lines on the plant material which allow for the moisture to leave the plant more easily. That's a close-up of another metal flower conditioner. Some are made out of nylon. And finally, you may also hear about high-performance mower conditioners or super conditioners, and there's a range of these. And they work by severely crimping the material. Um, they may leave it in a windrow, they may leave it in a mat. And again, it's all about causing damage to the plant. And you can see on the right-hand side, you've got the little creases in the plant. That's an area where moisture can escape from the plant and that's what we're all about. So when we last week when we talked about it we looked at the fact that we need to achieve a dry matter content of between say 35 and 40 for chop silage and between 45 maybe 50, 55 for bale silage and that we need to wilt the material to get up to that dry matter content. So wilting What's the impact of wilting on livestock? Well, this is some European data which is a range of experiments and it looks at the effect of wilting on intake and on live weight gain in beef cattle. So you'll see there that by wilting you can increase intake on average by about 6.5% but the range is quite significant, between 14 and 85% increase in intake by wilting. That's with cattle. If you look more closely to see what sort of impact that has on live weight gain, if you look at the average there, there's very little impact on wilting on live weight gain. And more importantly, the range is quite, um, is, you know, either size. It goes from minus to a quarter of a kilo to a quarter of a kilo gain by wilting. So what we need to do is we need to say what is it about wilting that enables us to achieve that live weight gain or intake and live weight gain improvement as opposed to a, a net result which is pretty similar to an unwilted crop. This data combines a number of experiments and then does a prediction to look at the impact of dry matter content on dry matter intake, so how much an animal would eat, and these beef cattle. Most of this data would come from experiments with ryegrass, but a significant amount would also be from experiments um, that have some clover or some other pastures and crops. What you will notice there is there's a line going across saying 100. In Australia, we're pretty lucky in terms of weather. We're able to cut silages, wilt them, 
and we achieve a good fermentation by wilting, which is what we talked about last week. In many of the European countries, traditionally that hasn't been possible either because they were making silages when the conditions were quite wet, they were cool, and they couldn't get an a, a good wilt, combined with the fact that a number of the experiments from the past didn't have access to really good equipment that we do now to speed up the wilting process. So what in Europe, what a lot of silages were made with was they either added an acid or some other acid type product so that it effectively dropped the pH and you ended up with a good fermentation artificially. So where it says 100% intake unwilted silages, that's pretty much saying that we've created an unwilted silage by using an acid or some other additive so that the, the fermentation is not affecting or depressing intake, which is what we talked about last week. Poor ferment, fermentation, reduced intake, reduced production. What you'll see there, that as dry matter content goes from just over 20% to 55%, this combined data set predicts that as you increase dry matter contact intake increases up to about that 55%. Dry matter content of the silage, which is your bale silage is at the top end, and you're getting about a 35% increase in intake compared to an unwilted silage. If we look at this a little bit more closely though, we'll see that the effect of dry matter content and, in, and intake will depend on what level of dry matter they achieve and also how long it takes to get there. So if we look at this graph, what's happened is we've predicted that what would happen at the bottom green line if we wilted the pasture, and again ryegrass, to 20% dry matter, what happens if we got there in one day and we get a slight improvement? If it takes longer than one day, it starts to decline, and by two days you're actually reduced intake by taking that long but only achieving a 20% wilt. What you'll see with the yellow line or that above it is that if you get to 24% you'll get a bigger improvement and one day wilting time but if it takes two days to get it you'll still get an improvement however you're on a decline so the longer it takes to achieve your target dry matter content the lower the dry matter intake is going to be. Now if you consider that we want to make silages at about 35% dry matter, we'll let's look at that blue line, you'll see that if we can get chopped silages wilted to the desired target dry matter in one day, we'll increase dry matter intake by about 35%. However, again, it drops. If we can get 45%, which is the, probably the bottom end of the target for bailed silages, we'll actually get over 40% intake. However, what you will also notice is not only does it decline with the length of time it takes to wilt, that about two days appears to be the point at which it goes from a relatively rapid decline in intake or relative dry matter intake and starts to level off a bit. So this reason, along with a few others, we su suggest that you need to wilt as quickly as possible and that two days should be the target as the longest period. I know that's not always easy. I know that at times um, the weather works against us and all the rest of it. But we'll look at ways that we can try and maximise that and maximise that wilting rate and achieve the target that we want. I have one slide here which I'm looking at the impact of wilting on land production. Now for relevance, this is Scandinavian data and it's grass pasture made into round bars. So applicable to what happens in Australia in terms of the, the production system and the storage system, individually wrapped round bars. Where it differs is at times they have great difficulty in wilting, 
So they've made silages with a wool, with a dry matter content at 24%, 25%, or they've wilted it to just about 42%. A bit wetter than we would do, but, but it's not that dissimilar. And we do occasionally see silages at that dry matter content, so it does happen. Two things we'll notice initially is that the pH of the unwilted is not that low. Even though it's an unwilted silage, it's got a lot of moisture content, it's 5.44. That's sign of a dodgy fermentation, as we noticed last week. Where, and the ammonia nitrogen is over 10, another sign of a dodgy fermentation. If we look at the wilted silage, however, you'll see that the pH is 5.9, not dissimilar to what we get here, and a much better, a much lower ammonia nitrogen content. The interesting thing to notice with that is that the sugar content, the WSC percentage of dry matter, is 2.1 in the unwilted, but it's still 10.1 in the wilted. That means the sugar is equating to 8% of the dry matter that were in the unwilted silage have been fermented. Now, whether they've been fermented to lactic acid or other products, I, I can't guarantee. But I do know that with a pH of 4.4, 5.44, sorry, that would have meant that that silage would have gone and undergone a, a pretty ordinary fermentation. And my guess is that there's a significant amount of that sugar that's been wasted or converted into... Um, products other than lactic acid, potentially clostridial products like butyric acid, and what's more, the protein's been degraded. If we look at the impact on lamb production, you can see that unwilted versus wilted, lower versus higher intake, which is again that fermentation quality ammonia effect. Lamb live weight gain basically reflects the effect that um, Intake of one is much higher than intake of other. Remembering that it, it, this is a typical example where for the wilted silage, the intake is 920 grams a day and for the other is 780 grams a day. 780 grams equates to a live weight gain of 114 grams per day. The additional intake between 780 and 920, 240 grams of silage, is going into production. All the maintenance requirements of those animals are already met, so that is going 100% into production. That's why you get such a massive increase in production for proportionately smaller increase in intake. So our target is to reach or our aim is to reach our target dry matter as soon as possible. Ideally, mow, wilt and harvest within 24 hours, preferably no than, longer than 48 hours so that we're not losing that intake advantage. How do we do that? Well, there's a few logical and obvious steps. The first one is aim for periods of fine weather. We know light crops wilt more quickly. Wait to the dew to lift. I mean, a really heavy dew can equate to one to two tonnes of water across that crop per hectare, and so we don't want to have to dry it off after we've cut if we can dry it off while the crop's still standing. We can use a mild conditioner, leave wide rows, low-density windrows, and use a tether, preferably straight after mowing. Now, some of that sounds intuitive and some of it probably doesn't. Um, the next point is sunshine provides more drying than wind. Now we often talk about and traditionally talk about wind being important for drying but it's actually direct sunlight that increases the wilting rate much more so than wind and the ideal is a nice sunny day with a bit of a wind or some breeze there to, to blow away any moisture that evaporates. Now why? What I've got here is a picture of a leaf. So it's a cross section of a leaf, if you can imagine, cut through. And, and what you will see is those little pores where the arrows are pointing, 
called stomates or stoma stomata. And at this stage, you can see from the one on the top, they're actually open. While they're open, those plants are going to probably lose about 100 litres per tonne of material every hour. So effectively, what's happening in that plant is the same as when it was before it was cut. So it's still respiring away. And in theory, it's sucking moisture up out of the ground and a certain amount of moisture is escaping. However, when those plants realise that the, the, they're losing moisture and they're not replacing it, they close those pores, they close those stomachs, as, as plants do in hot, dry weather. As a way and a mechanism of conserving moisture within the plant, they close those. Now, that means that the rate of loss drops from, say, 100 litres per tonne per hour down to 20 litres per tonne per hour. The interesting thing is that only takes about half an hour to two hours to happen. So what we want to do is maximise the amount of moist moisture loss we can achieve while that period of st is still there, while the stomates are open. And I've, I've just noticed a, a comment there that it's so much easier to make forage sorghum silage in January than ryegrass silage in August. Now, I'm, I'm guessing that's part to do with the fact that it's a lot hotter and drier in in uh, January than in August. But we might look at a couple of things relevant to that in a minute. So what do we do? First thing we do is we spread our swath out as much as we can. If we can achieve that 90 to 100% ground cover, we will achieve much faster wilting. The second thing we need to look at is we can TED. So this is a little tool that's become more common, which has a big impact. Previously, I said a couple of slides back that if when those stomates are open, you lose 100 litres per, per hour. When you TED, you can increase that to at least 150 litres per hour. So when you're talking about, for example, making ryegrass silage in August, which is difficult, um, very difficult, we want every technique we can to try and speed that up. And one of the techniques that we've got is tedding. Now, I've got some data which is probably quite quite relevant. This is a ryegrass crop. It's overseas data. So we've got something that's just under four tonnes of dry matter per hectare. And we cut it at nine o'clock in the morning. You'll see there that if we mow and condition it and ted it, twice daily, you will, we've been able to achieve a dry matter content of over 40% within a day and a half. So from 9 o'clock in the morning to 2 o'clock the following afternoon. Um, however, if we didn't do that, and we did what we used to do in the past, which was we left, we cut a great big wide swath and we pulled it together and we left it sit there, that, if you can imagine a 6.6 metre mower with one swath, you'll see there that by 2 o'clock in the afternoon, we're only at about 23% dry matter content. So a major difference between leaving it in a swath versus tedding it and mower conditioning. If you look at this next one, you'll see that we used a mower conditioner and we had a 2.5 metre cut and we left it at 50% wide. So we got an improvement. So by the next afternoon, we're getting close to fine chop. We're at 30%. However, if we use that same oil conditioner, 2.4 metre cut, and increase the width out to 1.6 metres, so, so not a big difference. We're, we're down at, we're over 35%. So what that clearly shows, that if you take a set crop and how you manage that crop really has a major impact um, on how quickly that's going to well how quickly it's going to dry now we we have all these tools at our disposal we can do all this sort of stuff and to show that it isn't just an impact in um, ryegrass 
or impact in, in August or sometime like that. This is some data which was done down at Nara on the south coast of New South Wales and it looked at Kaikia grass in February from memory which was either mown and left in a wide swath near mower width. Alternatively, it was just mowed and windrowed at the time of mowing. So no impact of tedding, but purely and simply an impact of it leaving it as wide as you can. Now what you'll see that um, initially those crops were about 12-13% dry matter content, but there's a marked difference in the rate at which they dry down. So to achieve 35% dry matter content by leaving the material out took 30 hours. So pretty easy to achieve a chopped silage within two days and meet our target. However, if we left it pulled together, we only got there after 54 hours. So we're not achieving our, our um, target of four, two, two days. Treatment one, where we did all the extra work, it left it out. If we um, left it a little bit longer, we left it for our two hour period. We were nearly ready for barling. We're just over 40%. So huge difference again by just simply leaving it out and letting the sun get at it. What happens if we TED? Well, we looked at another three experiments, again, Kaikia grass. In this case, we had the material left at the width of the mower and tedded once per 24-hour period, as opposed to a slow wilt, which was material left in a windrow and not tedded. So you'll see that under excellent drying conditions, on the left, we've got the fast wilt treatment, and we've achieved over 30% dry matter content in six hours and we started at a slightly wetter than the time before whereas we're still at 25 percent in slow wilt treatment now if conditions get a little bit worse like they were excellent drying conditions nice warm sunny dry if it gets a little bit if they're not so good but they're average in this case moderate drying conditions in two experiments the average of two experiments where we started off with Kaikia, which is again around that 13% dry matter content. You can see that after 30 hours, we did meet our target 35 for chopped silage, and it took us 48 hours to only just get to about 32% for the um, slow wilted treatment, which is just left in a big windrow. So the points I'd like to take out of that are first, mower conditioner, second, spread it as wide as you can and third head the material so it dries more quickly so that you get, uh, try and achieve everything in the pit within or in the bar within one to two days it's a, it should be the target all the time now on on um that it's a couple of questions i just want to um or points i'll bring up firstly i did there was a question about uh, tropical grasses, how, making silage out of tropicals and uh, any tricks for ensiling tropicals. Well, tropicals have very low sugar content. So we talked about sugar last week and sugar makes lactic acid. So m more than anything else with a low sugar product like a tropical, which has got less sugar than a clover even, you need to wilt that material as quickly as you can but it's, the trick is to make sure you achieve your target dry matter content because if that material goes into the pit too wet, it will end up with a poor fermentation. It'll probably end up with a fermentation that may not be clostridial, but it's one that will produce a lot of acetic acid, the vinegary sort of smell, which means some loss of quality and some loss of palatability. That's probably the main trick for tropicals. Yes, they can be done, but do them as quickly as possible. And I'm aware of instances where people have been able to make kaikia silage, which is obviously a typical tropical, um, within one day for barling by just working on it, wilting, tedding, quick, tedding, wilting quickly and mild conditioning. The other question I've got here is can you make silage from clover about 20 centimetres high? And the answer is yes, you can, but 
the proviso I would put in when something's 20 centimetres high is make an assessment of whether or not you're going to lose a lot of that material by mowing, conditioning, tedding and working on it. The, whilst what I've told you is how to maximise wilting rates, which is good for crops that are, or pastures that have got a reasonable volume of material, usable density. If in fact you've got a, a crop or a pasture, and, and for example drought stress crops or, or very short pastures, very thin pastures, be aware that if you wilt, sorry, if you tear before, in part of your wilting, that, and then you need to rake it to pull it back in together again, you may experience quite a lot of loss. Now, we have a rule of thumb that says if it's under about two tonne, and this is based on very minimal sort of anecdotal evidence, if the, the yield is under about two tonne, you're probably better off to graze it, but if, it's, if you need to, to make silage out of it, in that case, I would be suggesting you mow condition it and leave it reasonably wide but you probably don't tet it because the losses that you incur will be quite extensive during wilting and potentially over 20 to 25 percent of the material will be just lost through like particularly when you rake it. Um, the, this is another random question that comes up all the time. If I'm going to make silage should I cut it in the afternoon because the sugars are higher? Yes, that's true. Sugars are higher. And there has been some American data that showed that if you cut in the afternoon to make hay, you will end up with a product that is a little bit more palatable for some livestock. But let's think about this. If we cut in the afternoon when the sugars are high, we're, rel we're relying on the fact that um, there, sh well, if I go back, what happens is during the night, the plants basically respire those sugars to, for continuing growth um, and the amount of sugar in the plant declines overnight. And then when the sun comes out the next day, it photosynthesizes and it produces more sugar. So you'll get this fluctuation whereby sugars are high in the afternoon, uh, decline overnight and start to build up in the morning. It imp it's only going to happen if you've got a warm sunny day. So if, if your conditions are a little bit overcast or a bit cloudy, you're probably not going to gain it. But pro probably the biggest concern is that if you cut in the afternoon, those plants are going to respire more overnight because they're still wetter. So essentially they're quite fresh. So you've cut earlier um, in the afternoon or mid-afternoon to capture those sugars, but the amount of respiration overnight could be quite significant. As opposed, if you cut in the morning and you, you cut, say, 10 o'clock or 9.30 when the dew's gone, sugars might be lower, but by the time you get to the mid-afternoon, if you've gone to the effort of mower conditioner tedding, leaving the material out, and it's reached 30 plus percent dry matter or, or higher, the amount of respiration that will occur overnight is probably going to be minimal. So that's one trade-off. The other trade-off is if you have to, if you cut overnight, it may take you an extra day to wilt, which is not ideal because you want to get it done as quickly as you can. But how, again, we have to be a little bit practical um, because obviously most people will be in a situation where they will cut in the morning and they'll cut through to a certain time in the day and then potentially make silage the next day or the day after. If the paddock's really big, they may choose to keep cutting or they might say, well, practically there's a limit to how much of that material I can bale or chop the harvest, so therefore I will cut a certain amount in one day and then a certain amount the following day and make it stagger it in that way. The other thing I, I wanted to just bring up Remember last week we talked about losses and where about the losses fitted into the whole system and we had effluent losses and storage losses and field losses and you will see there that the field losses between the blue line and the brown line increase as you get drier. 
Well, this particular graph refers to Lucin. It's again in that manual if you want to look at it in more detail. The interesting thing is if you look at um, tedding and raking, and they've done it at 30, 40, and a range of dry matter contents, uh, you'll see that both tedding and raking increase losses um, as, it, it, as the material becomes above 40% dry matter content. So now loosen is obviously one of the more difficult plants because the it's easy to fracture the leaf if it's a bit dry of the stem. But what you'll see there, if you look at tedding down the bottom, 30 and 40%, you're losing about 1% of the dry matter every time you do an operation. With raking, it's about 2% every time you do an operation. But once you exceed that, and for example, if you're raking at 50%, you're looking at 3% losses. If you're raking at 60%, and some people do go that high, you're looking at 6% losses. So my advice is, apart from the fact that don't go to 60% and try for that 45 to 50% for bales, in most circumstances, put it in the windrow at around that 40% dry matter content or a little bit more so that you don't run the risk of losing a lot of the material by, by raking later on. There's really probably no reason why anyone would want to tear that late, but they may want to rake that late. Now, those losses will be less for some pastures and, and some crops than, than for loosen, but nevertheless, the, the, the general principle is the same. So, what, what we've talked about so far is achieving a dry matter content for a target wilting. My... The question that I'm often asked is that's very simple, but how do we how do we just how do we determine what the actual dry matter content is? And there are a couple of ways to do that. And one in the field is we can take a sample, we can cut it up, and then we can squeeze it. What we find is if um, and then we can release it and we can have a look at it. And we have a little bit of a gauge here which says that if it's really wet less than 25%. When you squeeze that, you'll, you'll get moisture running through your fingers. We all know what that's like. However, if it's a bit wetter, 25 to 30, so still not where we want it at yet, it'll hold that shape and the moisture will, st there'll be moisture on the hand. And it'll probably effectively it'll be a damp little ball. Where we want is sort of that 35 to 40%, and in the 30 to 40% rain, the ball falls apart slowly, and there's little or no moisture on your hands. And once we get to more than 40%, you'll find that that springs apart, no moisture. And for chopped, it's certainly, you should be into it, and for bale, probably close. Now, that is an objective measure, but I would suggest to you, when you're feeling fairly proficient, you may be able to use that, but initially you might want a more objective test. For example, if you want to compare clover with with cereal crop, you'll find that at the same dry matter content, they will feel different. The clover will compress more, it will feel wetter, whereas the cereal, because of its nature, will feel drier and it will spring apart more. So anyway, what do we do? Well, we can use a dry matter test. Now, for those of you unfamiliar with a dry matter test, um, there's the, probably the first rule or the first important thing is to just realise that if you don't do this properly, you're potentially going to burn your sample. And if you burn your sample, you're going to be in a lot of trouble. And if you do that in the kitchen, you won't get rid of the smeller and you'll be in lots and lots of trouble. So what do we do? Similar to what we did before, and we take a representative sample. We chop it up and we weigh it. Now, for simplicity's sake, I would generally weigh out 100 grams. And that's 100 grams fresh. You can do it on your kitchen scales. You can do it anything that's, that's reasonably accurate, probably at about a gram. 
you put it into the oven, the microwave oven, and you give it a bit of a blast. And you may do it for high power for a minute or, or high power for 30 seconds. Continue to do that while it feels damp and wet. And it'll get hot. And mix it up regularly so that you're exposing the, the material to equally to the microwaves. You'll get to a stage, though, where the material will start to feel dry. At that stage, two things. Firstly, put a glass of cold water in and reduce the length and the power at which you dry the material. The reason being, it, microwaves can cause the material to, fo to catch a light. And if they're really dry, they will, the material will catch light, then you've got the disaster. If you've got a glass of cold water in there, that water will capture any spare microwaves running around and so it won't be an issue. Couple of points though. Firstly, if that water starts to get hot, it'll start to steam. As it starts to steam, take it out, empty it out, put more cold water in because all that will happen is you'll be creating a humid environment and the moisture will be reabsorbed. This, the, the second thing is continue to mix that material up so that you don't end up with all those dry bits out so that they're hit first by the microwaves. When it feels dry, weigh it. Dry it for a bit longer, weigh it. When you get to a stage where it's really not changing in weight, so for example, you get to 35 grams and the next time it's close to 35 grams, pretty much take it that that's the right answer and that means 35 grams out of 100 grams, it's 35% dry matter content. Now, again though, just remember, if you, that is quite critical. Make sure you put the water in, make sure it's cold, you don't have to put ice cubes in it, um, and that's a good way to go. Now, unlike last week, we seem to have gone through this fairly quickly, so I've got a couple more questions, and any more questions coming through would be greatly appreciated. Otherwise, we can, we'll, um, we'll address these for a start. Now, one of the questions was preferred time from cutting to baling. I think we've pretty well covered that. Um, and that is within 48 hours, ideally. Um, but if you can do it within 24 hours, that would, would be good. I'd like to also say, again, that all this material is available either on the DPI website or contact your local land services office because they'll, they'll either have access to the material or they'll be able to contact somebody else who will be able to get it for you. And they're a good, they're a good centre for getting all this material. So on that, Sue, I'm actually finished this, the main slides that I wanted to go through today and I suppose I could summarise by saying Achieving a target dry matter content will end up with a better quality silage because of the fermentation, which we discussed like last week. But also from an animal point of view, it will increase intake and palatability and production. However, to achieve that, we need to build as quickly as we can. We, we now have the tools that we can do that by male conditioning and tedding. And there really is no reason and, and I, why people aren't able to, to produce a good quality silage by wilting quickly. And um, I know in the past I've seen some classic examples, for example, Kaikia silage bailed within 12 hours. Uh, silage is pr produced in near Warrnambool in August in what's obviously a horrible climate in terms of drying by simply using tools like mild conditioning and tedding and picking your weather and being prepared to put a little bit of effort into the wilting so that you end up with um, the silage you want. Now I have, I have got a question here. Sheep seem to prefer drier silages and I would agree with that. Uh, sheep, I would, I would typify sheep as being much fussier than cattle. Cattle seem to um, be more able to become accustomed to silage more quickly and more easily. Couple of tricks, I suppose. Firstly, um, if you if you consider 
and and um, that effectively what you're doing when you make silage and it's a, it's a wetter silage, you're producing lactic acid. So it's going to be like yogurt. So it will be a little bit sour to taste. It won't be super sweet, whereas dry silages, which we touched on last week, are going to have more sugar left, so they will be more palatable. Some people love yogurt. Other people don't. So it, be, it, it becomes a bit of a preference. Now, in terms of sheep, they don't seem to have that preference for that taste. Two, two ways you can, you can do that. You can go down the dry silage pathway. The other thing that's worth trying is feeding stock. If you, if you have some sheep that are accustomed to silage, feed lambs while they're still with their mothers, while they're still at foot, when they're a little bit older. And if the ewes will start to eat the silage, the lambs will start to eat the silage and you'll see that they'll become accustomed to it and they'll do better on it. You'll probably also find that uh, different silages sheep will probably take to a little bit more easily than others. Um, question, have, have seen people producing haylage, is this a good thing? I'm not going to say it's a bad thing other than to say that haylage, if we take haylage at being more than 60% or 55 to 60% dry matter content, you will reduce quality because you will increase losses. However, it is possible to produce a product at 60, even 70% dry matter content that looks and smells quite fine and the animals will do quite well on it. What what you need to ask yourself is whether or not by producing it something at 60 or 70 percent you're getting any animal intake and animal production benefit compared to producing at 50 percent and getting loss, any losses and potentially better live weight gain or potentially better dry, dry matter intake because it's higher quality. Difficult to say, it's a bit of a trade. My advice would always be go for closer to that 50 percent because I can't see any real advantage from a fermentation point of view of being drier, but I can see losses being greater. So in summary, haylage can look and smell good, but I think that it's best practice, you're better to go wetter. And in terms of what would you consider minimum temperature to wilt silage? Well, that's a, a good but interesting question, and to a degree I'll... Um, cover myself by saying it depends a little bit on what your yield is. If we're talking about a, a pasture that's probably yielding say three, three and a half tonne, I, I would have thought a fine sunny 25 degree day would have been sufficient to wilt that silage. Remembering if we compare ourselves to say Europe, their temperatures when they make silage are, are not that dissimilar. We do need to be aware though that when it's 25 degrees, if it's 25 degrees and the day length's quite short, your exposure to sun's not that great. So we need to take that into account. And if you're in a year where you're getting really heavy dews, um, so it's dripping wet every morning, then you're also going to have a problem. Therefore, assuming dry, uh, a, a moderately yielding pasture, and everything else in your favour or a for cereal crop or something, I would think 25 degrees. If you can get 25 degrees and you've got the equipment to mow condition and also TED, you would be able to make silage. If, however, you were talking about a cereal crop which had about 10 tonnes of dry matter and we're in a really wet year, I think you would really, really struggle. And then it becomes a trade-off in people's minds. So, it's, for example, I know that there are some people at the moment that are very concerned about the fact that the, the growth on cereal crops is much more than they would like to see them, and they're much more mature than they would like to see for this time of year. So can we cut those crops and produce silage and effectively it's a mechanical grazing? And I would say... Back in May, we probably could have got away with it, but between May and now, it's been too cool. The days have been too short. The dews have been too too um, too too big. They've been too heavy, and 
the temperature's been too low. Now, whether that'll change in the next three weeks or two weeks to, or how much it will change, I don't know. It's a nice sunny day out there at the moment where I am, but it's still only going to get to probably 16 or 17 degrees. So, I, And the days are still going to be fairly short. I would think you would struggle. Um, but if you're in an area that's a little bit further or more conducive to short for longer days, dry weather, you probably can get away with it in a couple of weeks. But we, we would normally say um, yeah, September's probably as early as most people would be able to go under most circumstances. Well, the, the question about the increase in dry matter intake with dry silages. How much is it due to animals bulking out on water? Uh, I'm not sure uh, to how much. Certainly at those really wet levels, I would expect the water level to have been an issue, uh, but I can't give you a proportion. And I can't tell you whether or not there's a point in time where there's some palatability thing that takes over as opposed to the amount of water. Um, for those of uh, probably aren't aware, high too much... Pastures that are very, very um, luscious, uh, they, they, then you, you've got a lot of water and that water can actually reduce intake. So in most beef and sheep enterprises, not a major deal, but certainly in the dairy industry, um, very lush, wet pastures are a problem because they, the amount of water depresses intake. Can you get more tons in the pit at higher dry matters and a more stable pit bales? Um, no, you probably can't get more tons in a pit at higher dry matters because it's, if anything, it's probably going to be harder to, to pack. Uh, it's a, it depends a little bit on what you mean by dry. But if you're, if you're 35 to 40 percent in, say, a clover, you'll probably uh, pack it very well. You will get some. Uh, it may become more difficult after that. But if it's, a, for example, a cereal and the chop length is a little bit longer, at 40% that'll be quite difficult to pack because it's quite spongy and bulky. So in a pit, chop length, chop silages, dry, too dry, you poor compaction. However, the next part there is and a, and, and a more stable pit with bales. Bales do all the compaction for you, um, so they really don't, you don't have the issues of running backwards on a tractor and something that's spongy and it's not going to compact easily. It's all it's all done for you. So the higher dry matter content isn't really an issue in terms of compaction for square bales, which I'm assuming most people will use now. As to whether or not that is more or less stable, um, in the pit itself, provided there's no air gets in and no mo moisture gets in, it's going to be the same. However, when you open that up, uh, one of the issues will be um, how in one of the issues in terms of how quickly that goes off will be how much free sugar is still left in those crops. So if you can imagine that when we cut a plant, a certain amount is, is converted to acid, chopped silage, preserved. The drier we get, which, which is sort of what we talked about last week, the drier we get, the less of that sugar is converted into acid till we get to a point that around 50% dry matter content, there's very little fermentation. So there's very little um, fermentation of that sugar to acid. The sugar is what's most readily broken down and causes heating and instability at a pit. So simple answer is, Dryer silages may be less stable because they have higher sugar contents than wetter silages because they have lower fermentation. In terms of pits, it's probably hard to adjust that too much because even lower dry matter bale silages are still going to have reasonable sugar levels. It's probably going to be more the material that you put in is going to determine that. So something like a high sugar cereal or a high sugar ryegrass will be less stable, whereas a loosened or a clover I would expect to be quite stable for, for quite a few days. So it looks like I'm running out of questions, so um, should I turn over to you now?
Thank you so much for that, John. Um, some really, really fantastic questions there. Um, and I hope you all got something out of the webinar today um, and that you will all continue to join us for these webinars. So thank you so much, John, for um, all your wonderful information today.